Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSB Magazine. You're listening to a new The Hacker Factory podcast with hacker maker Philip Wiley. You're about to discover what the role of a professional hacker entails, the different specializations it holds, and what it takes to learn and become one. Enjoy the conversation as Philip and guests unveil the secrets of professional hacking, a mysterious, intriguing, and often misunderstood occupation. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hacker Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Wiley, the Hacker Maker. In each episode, I have an interesting guest sharing their unique stories of how they got started in offensive cybersecurity, uh, bug bounties, or security research. So this episode, I'm really happy to introduce my friend, uh, Joe Brinkley, the blind hacker. He does a lot for the community, has a really good story, and has a passion for educating and mentoring people. So he's like the perfect, perfect guest for this podcast. So thanks for joining. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you taking the time to, to uh, do this podcast. So would you mind introducing yourself for those that may not know you? So again, uh, Joe Brinkley, the blind hacker. It's uh, it's been it's been a heck of a story to try to tell this. Uh, so I guess I got that you know got the handle. I've always been a blind hacker, but I started calling myself the blind hacker a few years back when I was going a little bit more public with like my mentoring and research instead of just being like you know people that I know or would meet. Um, and then so I kind of picked the blind hacker too, kind of a kind of edgy, kind of cool, but also. Uh, um, it's, it's what I'm afflicted by, right? Like I have a visual impairment. I am legally blind. I can't operate motor vehicles. I use assistive and adaptive technology. Uh, you know, I, I, I need some help reading things sometimes in public, like, so, but I, cause I wanted to still also like draw attention to the fact that people with even visual disabilities can do this. Cause you know, uh, you know, uh, I see a lot of people getting, you know, talking about the community now that, Oh, you know, I'm, autistic or i'm on a spectrum somewhere or i'm i'm adhd or i'm these things and a lot of those deal with you know mental health but i didn't see many people with physical a physical identity and then um so then i started kind of like you know what i'm gonna i'm not gonna champion this i'm not gonna chair anything i'm just gonna come out and say hey i'm a hacker here's what i do but i'm also visually impaired in case you're curious about that and so far, it's worked. I get a lot of people asking me, how do you do what you do? And then I actually get the ability to take the time to show them how to you know, set things up for someone with a visual acuity uh, disability. I think that's a, a great thing. You're a great thing you're doing. And, you know, you're bringing awareness to that. You're inspiring others to let them know they could do that. And it's good that you bring that out because I know I have really close friends that have things that affect them physically but like a remote jobs, they won't let, they really don't disclose, you know, their uh, disabilities. And, you know, and one of my best friends, he's, you know, super highly effective, a really great worker and does a great job, but, you know, they kind of worry about that. So that's good that you're, you're doing that because you show others that you can still do things and, you know, you can even help other people that they may have some certain thing affecting them and re realize that, you've ever co overcome a lot more challenges than what they have. And that's encouraging for everyone. Yeah, it's definitely, again, it's, it's, you know, I, I see the gambit of spectrum, the spectrum of all the things. And then, you know, the, the really interesting thing now is I get a lot of people as we're getting, uh, as, as the gray beards are becoming a little bit more prevalent in the community, I'm getting like, you know, those kind of questions like, you know, uh, you know, I'm not quite there yet, but how would you do this? Like, Oh, yeah, just screen zoom in add a little bit more uh, tone to your terminal, uh, maybe find competing colors and to help them kind of still mask those things. Cause uh, I tell you what, the first time I did my hacking while blind talk at DerbyCon, um, it was unnerving. I, I'm just telling the world like, Hey, 
yeah, again, I do. I'm a hacker, but I'm also a visually impaired. But here's what it looks like to be visually impaired. Here's what it sounds like to be those things. And it was, uh, it was still very nerve wracking. Yeah. Especially that, to be public about it. Oh, I bet so. And that, that's good that you show people that there's workarounds for that. Some people may not realize. I'll, yeah. Yeah. I also think it's good with, with good branding for those you know people out there that are new to the industry. If you brand yourself well, it, 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 it helps a lot. So I'm sure you've probably benefited from the recognizable brand. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I've got, uh, I've got the telltale, like, you know, visually impaired eye with the slash, you know, that's the like kind of global community standard for visually impaired or not visible, visible. Um, and then kind of played with that a little bit, adding a lock cybersecurity things to it. Uh, yeah. Building the brand as the blind hacker, you know, uh, a lot of people knew Joe B, Joe Brinkley, cause I'd always go around introducing myself, first name, last name, for some reason, that's like, you know, Oh, you're doxing yourself. It's like, I don't care. Uh, I don't do anything special enough to be, you know, people want to, you know, if you want to know where I live, I'll point the house out on the map. Uh, um, but then um, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, now I, I get, I get those ba- back and forth uh, things and uh, some notoriety from that. Cause you know, I get to wear this like now like blind hacker logo hoodies and things and built a brand around it. And, you know, uh, you're right though. Uh, you know, it's actually a key element, the branding, especially for new folks. Like it actually helped me get, you know, my job with the company I'm at now. I, I immediately came out and said like publicly, Hey, I'm looking. Uh, and it was, uh, actually yourself. who was like, uh, reached out to a friend of yours and said, Hey, this guy is looking, uh, you know, top notch talent you should give him a chance. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, amongst me saying that publicly, you recommending me a handful of other like guys that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I would love to still work for them. They're great guys. You know, uh, Tim over at Red Siege was like, Hey, do you want to come over here and work? And well, I did went through the interview process. Unfortunately, timing, uh, you know, Ben was, uh, over there at on defend was one of the first people to come back with the immediate offer and, and made things real good for me. And, you know, here it's been an hour a year and it that was the best thing I could have done was brand myself, come out as a mentor, give back to the community. Even when I don't think, what I'm doing is always the best. You know, I still doubt myself sometimes. I still go, oh, is this this thing that I'm building is the communities? Like, do these people actually care? And the answer to that is, well, yeah, because uh, it's a piece of it's a piece of hacker culture now, uh, and it makes sense to try to embrace it. And when you're real with it, it'll help you out to get those jobs easy, easy. So, uh, why don't you kind of share your story how you got started for our listeners? Yeah. So, oh boy, that's really, I, I, this story is almost one of those things that I kind of hate to tell because a lot of people start to like see similarities between their life. But again, there's, there's this whole, there's a recipe to make a blind hacker and it's not the recipe that everybody can use. But the way I ended up getting started was, uh, um, I was always into computers. Uh, you know, again, I could go back. Oh, I had a, you know, sick Commodore 64 at 386. Um, you know, I, I grew up, quite a bit poor too and so you know having uh being in the 2000s the late 2000s or early 2000s and the late 90s and the early 2000s still with a single core you know 600 megahertz you know k2 or 600 megahertz intel and literally hardware hacking it like with literally number one pencils drawing lines on the motherboard to get a little bit more power to my cpu so i can get a couple 65 more megahertz out of it uh, and and learning how to do uh, hacks on my kernel of my Windows system so that way the sound driver didn't load, giving me that two extra frames per second in certain games. Like, like I didn't know what certain games sounded like or looked like because I would disable colors in 16, 16, I'd go to 16 bit instead of 32 for the longest time because I wanted those extra frames out of it. Um, especially as I started to lose my vision, I was like, oh, now I got to get bigger monitors and figure out how to be accessible with my games and... Uh, and then it kind of strewn into from just playing right around in games, like, what do I do for a job? Because I can no longer, you know, I wanted to go in the military, I want to go in the Navy, want to go to Naval Academy, wanted to do amazing things. And, um, you know, they don't like that when you're visually impaired. Uh, you're not combat efficient or combat available. So they kind of turn your way, which is fine. Uh, and then I tried to go to university. I've told this story a couple of times. Uh, I tried to go to University of uh, Towson, and there was an educator there who told me I would never make it in the industry. And here, here I am, 18, 19, uh, you know, kind of like, oh, but I do all these things. And I go there, I take their uh, their entrance exam, like I build a computer, I'm installing Linux, I'm showing them I, I can write a little bit of HTML. And there's this one person, one person who said, 
yeah, you know, I just don't think you'll make it in this industry. And I kind of took that to heart and I actually did not do cybersecurity for a few more years. Uh, I, I was a plumber's helper. I was working with my dad. I was working with friends and, and kind of labor and, you know, being visually impaired. Some of those jobs are very dangerous. I'm using tools that honestly, some you know, chainsaws and uh, sawzalls and <laughs> things that someone who isn't quite visually acute should be using. And, um, and then I said, that's not me. I, I really like computers. I, I don't believe that educator anymore. Every time I talk to someone in the industry, they tell me I, I should be doing this. They can see passionate. I have knowledge. And then um, I went to the Department of Rehabilitation Services. I said, I want to do computers. Uh, they said, cool. And you know, after the investigation, okay, yes, you're blind. Um, let's get you something. Uh, I got an A plus. They said, cool, go do computers. And I was like, I need a lot more than this, guys. Like, this industry is very competitive. And so they hooked me up with a, a company. Ironically, I was interviewing at that company to get a job elsewhere. Um, and then I always tell this story uh, it's kind of separately. This is kind of my mentor. It's the first person who like gave me the chance, right? And she gave me the chance because she she heard something in me. She saw she saw the same thing. She heard me say the words Linux and things like that. Since so it's a nonprofit, they loved Linux and non this nonprofit. And um, this, this, I, every time I tell a story, she's this scratchy, deep voice woman smokes, at, you know, 12 packs of cigarettes a day. Um, if you remember Monsters, Inc., uh, ultimately the slug woman, you know, gray hairs, ne- Mike Wazowski, she sounded just <laughs> like that. And, I, and, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not insulting her. She's a very lovely one, one of the best people I've ever met in, on the planet. But she came from this back room and said, come with me. And I'm like, oh, God, what did I do now? And. I sit down on a Linux terminal. She's like, make it do stuff. And I'm like, LS, PWD, moving directories, um, uh, doing a few other things. And then she's, uh, she offers me a job there. And so I was like the system administrator for that nonprofit over the next few years. I got into a few more nonprofits just because it was like, it was easier to explain to them I had a disability, but it's okay. I can do the work because I have this track record. And because trying to explain you have a disability uh, in an interview, I started to realize that was probably the worst thing I could keep doing. Uh, like you, like we were talking about just moments ago, when you're visually impaired and you have something different about you and you're going to need some kind of help, a lot of companies, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to deal with this. This person might have these unreasonable requests rather than asking me like straight up. Uh, and you're like, well, technically, I don't have to tell you till you hire me. Then when you hire me, then I can hit you with it. But, you know, I, I was... I didn't know how to do these things. There's this there's this gray line where you don't have to tell them, but you kind of want them to know. So that way, when you get on board first day, they're not like, all right, cool, uh, run, shunt, you know, run, shoot, jump. And you're like, hold on, I actually need a little bit of help here. And that got to be tough. And and finally, after that, um, literally, I went from being the system administrator there uh, to a like system administrator lead at a place that was doing all kinds of refreshes and rollouts for uh smithsonian so i got to hang out with them for a little bit and do cool stuff with smithsonian and then you know i was like you know i really want to be in uh like heavier engineering and cybersecurity. but at the time this is like 2006 and 7 like cybersecurity was there but it was it was led by a bunch of guys in suits in the back room who all had cissps and you know they beat their chest about oh me cissp and you're like that's great, but you know, I, I I don't see I I don't know these words CISSP, and then you look it up and you start I start studying for it. And I'm like, and everybody's talking about this inch deep, mile wide, and you're like, you start studying for it, you're like, this almost has nothing to do with cybersecurity, <laughs> and you're like, oh, the compliance is not cybersecurity as we all know now. We 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 hear it said, but compliance, you know, good news is it taught me that. The reason I do some of the things I do. Oh, the re- why is it important to test password policy? Well, because if you have a written policy and you're not adhering to it, you're likely also not using a technical control for it. And if you're not using a technical control for it, I'm going to be able to break into your network. Right, right. So now I'm able to put those all together because of pushing through, getting the CISSP, getting the CEH. And then uh, I was working for a company as a system engineer. And I said, well, now I've got these C- I got a CISSP and a CEH. You guys said I could be a security person now. Can I be a security person they're like, sure, here you go. And then I'm like, cool, I'm going to make this amount of money because that's what all the, the ads on TV say I should be making. They're like, can't help you there. Um, so then I left and became an ISSO, even more compliance and stuff. And then uh, after two years of being an ISSO, and this is why this is where I'm saying, hey, the blind hacker recipe is, doesn't need to be the recipe for anybody else because you don't need to do these like weird stepping stones now. You don't have to go from a you know system administrator, system engineer to to 
cybersecurity. It will help you. You will have compliance. You will have background. You have experience. You will have things that are going to get you through the door, uh, those interviews, because uh, it's still hard to get into cybersecurity. But now you don't have to be uh, ISSO and have a CISSP just to be a pen tester. And then I, then the day I got to officially call myself a pen tester, I was on this travel team. I was traveling uh, 20 days a month. Uh, I was racking myself. I was doing some awesome things. Um, this is where I got some of my best, like, you know, spy stories, tradecraft stories, being in weird parts of the country, being in weird parts of the world, doing weird things. And it was glorious. And then I started to burn out already. <laughs> Here I am, uh, you know, 27 years old, like doing the thing that I absolutely loved. And I'm like, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> I'm doing it all the time. And, um, and then I, I stopped doing it for a little bit. I, I got more into like, uh, operational security, like, um, what can I help do? So I found a cyber threat unit where I could use my offensive talents to help bolster the defensive team. And I did that for about a year. And then uh, uh, one of the sequestrations got me caught up and, for the government, right? So where they downsized rapidly, um, found another gig and uh, stayed government for a few more years. And then eventually went commercial. And like I said, probably about four years ago, started a blind hacker thing, started mentoring, started teaching, because uh, I learned ways to teach people. I learned things that, you know, I started to learn when I'd go to conferences and try to speak to people, I was getting a crowd around me. People saw that what I had to say had value or just people wanted to listen to me. Maybe it's because my stylishly deep radio voice, uh, but whatever it was, I, I started noticing that. So I started doing that. Oh, well, that's awesome. So speaking of, you know, we need to take advantage of the time and, and get your thoughts on, on, you know, what you'd recommend to others that wanted to get started. These days, the first thing I tell people is foundations, fundamental fundamentals, expertise. And what I, what do I mean by that? Well, anytime we build something, a house, a car, uh, whatever, you start with a frame, you start with the foundation of a house. Um, and then, so to me, I, I got to say, Hey, like, I'm not going to tell you uh, this course, that course, this thing, this cert, um, because I've learned that I can say, oh yeah, just go get your network plus. Well, the company may require you to get you an A plus. I'm going to tell you, hey, for you to come, if if you wanted to say blind, I want you to hire me today. How do I hire? How do you hire me? I I would go. I need you to do network fundamentals or network foundations, and then network fundamentals. I need to see that you understand that there's communication on a network, that there's a TCP protocol, there's an IP protocol, UP, UDP, uh, you know, if you want to get crazy, IPX, UPX, like things that, you know, these things used to exist, they existed for a reason. What is SNMP? Because when you're doing pen testing, when you're being offensive specifically, you're going to use those things to your advantage. Your TCP protocols are going to be the thing that... You scan the network with your your understanding of the, the way the packets work. Uh, oh, I need you to do a SYN scan because if you do a TCP scan, it's going to probably like tank half the systems on the network because they're all archaic and don't know how to, uh, you know, do a close out TCV connections. And then you're going to leave me like, I don't know what those words mean. And we're like, well, then I can't use you as a pen tester. Um, and it's, it's it's things like that. So when you start looking at the foundation of the house, the foundation of your building, the foundation of your education, it's, it's really good to fill in, have a solid foundation. So I don't need you to be a CCIE and know everything about networking and to be like the, 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 the it person on a networking team. I just need you to know that when I say TCP IP, two-way handshake, three-way handshake, uh, WLAN, 802.11x, like that those at least in some form have meaning to you, that you understand them at a practical level, that if I handed you a router and a hub, that you'd be able to tell me kind of what the difference is, hopefully. And because you're go when you're attacking, when you're doing offensive things, those you're going to approach those two different things in two different ways. And then with, uh, you know, and then with the the fundamentals, that becomes like the timbering of the house, the frame of the building, uh, uh, steel, the construction, just the the skeletal infrastructure that holds everything up. Um, 
And so when you start to build the building and you start to put on things that you, you want to build upwards, that you're going to hold these things up, because as you learn, you should be progressing kind of what you would view towards a goal. And your goal is that peak, that, that emphasis is that, uh, you know, thing that you're reaching for and when you're reaching for it that's going to be the expertise that you're desiring in this case like right this is a offensive security podcast so you would hope that you're going for something a little bit more offense if you're a defensive person listening and you have interest in offensive security because you want to use it like hackers do i listen to blue team podcasts because i want to know what you guys are doing so i can counter it well you should be countering us that way too so as you get towards this level of expertise that starts to end the house and building metaphor that becomes the like the shielding, the glazing, the windows, the uh, the HVAC, the plumbing, the electrical, um, the finishing, the putting up crown molding, the you know the things that are going to be beautiful. Well, but in, in in this, there's a little bit more at the two expertise, right? You're starting to you're going to start filling in the rooms. You're going to start decorating them because you can absolutely be. Um, you know, in this whole thing, like you don't need to know how a house is built to decorate a room, but it helps to make sure that you're not going to put, you know, a million ton barbell in the middle of a room that, you know, only can support, you know, 10,000 pounds because you're going to go through the floor. So understanding concepts and availability and the way things should be organized becomes part of the fundamentals. And then towards that level of expertise, well, you know, in our offensive security realm, there's pen testers, right? There's malware authors, there's researchers, there's, um, so many other things like i even think dfir even though it's more defensive um i use a lot of uh, forensic level stuff to be offensive with things like i i'll capture a system you know to uh if i find a physical system i'll still run drive xl drive xml on it take my little copy of it home and be offensive with it pulling out sam files pulling out important data pulling out uh passwords.txt and now is that a level of expertise i expect every pen just to have no is that a level I have? Well, yes, because I built up a building that has a room specifically full of expertise and forensics. And so the best thing you can learn these days is the foundations, the fundamentals, and then focus on an expertise. And what does that mean? Again, you're going to look at a lot of networking. You're going to want to be familiar with security terms. You're going to want to be familiar with, you know, malware, some malware things. And as you build it, you'll start to see that you can look back and, see that you have a constructive path, that you've built a path. And, you know, and again, it's going to be your building. It's not going to be my building. It's not going to be Phil's building. It's not going to be anyone else's building. It's going to be your building. And you're going to be able to take pride in that building because it's standing on a solid foundation with solid fundamentals. And, you know, with the expertise, it's okay if it's spotty. Not every building has every floor with every room filled. Um, and that's okay. And so all you got to do is focus on the things that are going to, you know, help you break into the industry, stay in the industry, and then stay relevant in the industry. And that's a hard thing because it it's one of those things you got to understand that it's your story, not my story. And you 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 still you'll see similarities in our stories. And if somebody told you at some point you can't, or there's a gatekeeper, well, keep doing it anyway. Um, I'm going to tell you now: don't take you know a few years off like I did. Don't wait. Do the thing you're passionate about because people are going to see passion in you and give you the opportunities like I was given. People are going to see the branding you're building on Twitter and they're going to give you an opportunity. And they're going to see that you do have fundamentals, that you do have these foundations and this level of expertise. So what what are your views on uh, certifications and degrees? What, what are your uh, opinions and thoughts on that? This is a very subjective matter here, Phil. Um <laughs> Um, I encourage people with any form of education because when people start telling me, I want to get into InfoSec, I'm going to tell you now, that's actually where you get your fundamentals, your foundations from is some form of education. So if you get a certification, great. If you get a degree, great. I don't think either one is right. Either one is wrong. Um, and I'm going to say that because I have found that some people I've tried to sit down and mentor people who I would, I spent so much time hand in hand with them and they still couldn't develop the concepts. They couldn't get a solid foundation. They went and took a, um, 
they, they went to their local university, the, the community college or an online university and started going through the things. And now they have a little bit more foundation. But I've also taken people who were starting to like, oh, I need a degree. I have to have a degree. I'm like, you don't have to. Like, let, let's talk to me. Uh, next thing you know, I pointed them at like some uh, study things for certs. Six certs later, they're they're making more money than they ever thought imaginable. Right. And it's it's totally a thing that can happen. Um, I try to be agnostic about the things that I recommend, but me personally, um, at this point in my career, I'm only doing hands-on things, right? Offensive security and their whole trove of additional new certifications they're throwing out there, the uh, Mac exploitation, Linux exploitation, those things, those are things that are on my list because it's going to be practical. I'm not going to do multi-choice. I'm not going to be beep, boop, bop, and A, C, D, B, F. No. I'm going to be very hands-on, and that's what I need at this point in my career. And I've learned that's how I learn. Um, and if, you know, maybe in another, you know, I'm getting to be a little bit older, maybe another 15, 20 years here, I'll go back to a, a quick university, an online university, spend two or three, four years going through training, educating, getting the degree, and then, you know, wrap up the rest of my career as an educator saying these exact same things you don't need to be here but if you are like let me help you figure out how you learn and i want to do the thing that's best for you great advice yeah i like that yeah the the offensive security stuff is is hard to beat that's kind of really when i started it got my first pen testing job and i had appsec experience some network sec security experience and sysadmin experience and need to learn how to hack so i took the OSCP, and that was where I gained my hacking skills. So I, I, I agree with that. For sure, for sure. So what do you think, what are your feelings about, because, you know, there's some people that say you have to know how to code. Some people say you don't have to. I had Alyssa Knight on here, and Alyssa Knight doesn't know how to code. And But then again, some other folks will say, yeah, I, I you know, you should learn. So what, what what's your opinion? That I, Again, such loaded questions, Phil. Um, <laughs> that's actually a fantastic question. Um I learned how to code when I was younger, again, being a, a total computer nerd. I learned basic. I learned some visual basic. And then in my high school, they actually offered visual basics dot net. It was one of the first uh, languages I learned was dot net visual basic six dot net. Um, and then the following year was a C sharp course. And that's for some reason I can't recall any of that. So I just remember hating every minute of C sharp <laughs> and assembly. So what I uh, so then I start doing this stuff professionally, um, and there was a gap from when I when I did it professionally day one to literally in the last 18, 24 months that I my level of coding of programming zero percent programming everything I was doing was barely coding I would write PowerShell scripts I would write batch scripts I would write shell scripts. And not, and not that I think that, and some people argue that's not coding, Joe. I'm like, true. It's, it's, uh, it's a form of automation. It's a form of, um, it's not programming, Joe, it is, but uh, to me, that is coding. But it, I think knowing those things are going to make your life easier. Um, automating the installation of tools, automating the setup of a script the minute you get onto a box, uh, you know, I'll give you an example, right? When you Kerberos and you're using fake tickets, you know, generated tickets, and, and you create a fake user, a fake service, you get on the box, you have a set short period of time till it checks in with the actual LDAP or the Active Directory server and goes, no, that user's not supposed to be on there and nicks you out, right? Well, in that short period of time, if you can execute, say, said script that you wrote, now you can potentially have persistence. You can have a backdoor. You can have well, any number of things, right? So it's going to help. Do you need it? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, again, I barely touched it. I would have to. I would be all over Stack uh, Stack Overflow and things, uh, googling PowerShell. How to write these PowerShell things? Oh, I just need to bring down all as a sysadmin AD users, uh, map shares, this that. Now, a lot of that's become second nature to me. Uh, writing it in Python over the last few years it kind of becomes second nature. I'm still I still don't consider myself a Python Python programmer by any means. If you ask me to write something from scratch, like 
oh, uh, you know, I need a game that, uh, you know, inflates a balloon. <laughs> Good luck. That. I don't know how to do that, Bill. Um, but if you came to me and said, hey, I need something to automate, like, these 15 repeatable tasks, like, got you. Um, now, last uh, year, working with uh, On Defend and uh, just myself, I started to hear these words about Go, Go Lang. Um, and it's anytime people ask me, what language should I learn? I almost wanted to say, just start screaming, go lang, go lang, go lang, because it's been when, when, uh, when I started to like really use it full time, um, to do some of the things I turned around and I was like, all right, learn go lang in 24 hours. I, I read the Python 24 hour book. I keep having to read the C sharp book over and over. Uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced at this point, I will never learn C, C sharp. It's, it's, it, my brain can't comprehend it, but I learned the Python one. Um, I read uh, some of the v, uh, like C sharp stuff, like Visual Basic and .NET C sharp level stuff. Um, I looked at the NIM because I saw offensive NIM coming out, the Iron Python, and I started going, "All right, these things I can see, I can kind of code in them." And then when I went to go grab GoLang, I was like, "Huh, this almost reads like a book." Intro, import things, do some things. You don't have to worry about creating too many variables here. And you keep going down halfway through. If you want to create more variables, guess what? You can totally do it. Okay, so this, I can write in this language like I think. And it seems to have worked so far. Um, but are you going to need that for a normal pen test or offensive security job? Not when you start out. Maybe not even when you become an expert. Uh, will it help you? Yeah, if you want to automate those things, uh, run recon, you know, the best thing I ever did was uh, created my uh, tool that I, I I don't really name my tools, but I wrote a tool that essentially minute one boots up responder or uh, uh, boots up crack map, hits portions of the network, hits up responder, grabs that generated uh, list from crack map, then turn around, turns on pcrack, uh, pcreds, uh, and starts to pull it from the uh, network and starts to grab those and then opens them all up in their own um I still use screen. I know people keep trying to tell me to use Tmux. I can't. I can't. I keep trying, but I still use screen. So it'll open all those up in their own screens. And then, you know, uh, I can literally leave that, you know, oh, that's minute one, day one. That's how I get domain admin in 30 minutes or less. If you've seen that uh, live talk of mine. Um, and then what? And then what? Like, do, do I need to be a programmer to do that? No, I literally said, do this thing when this thing completes, if this or else this, or tell me, hey, it's not installed here. Cool. If it's not installed here, literally offer me an option. Would you like me to install? Then I hit Y and hit enter. Then it does APT install these tools. And so it's like, if you can do that, and if I can take something that might take me half an hour and make it six minutes, isn't it worth your time to try to learn it? Yeah, great advice. Loved hearing your point of view on that. You know, it's like uh, I just kind of had an idea what you would, what you would say, but that's that's good because I mean everyone has their their different points of view on it. But yeah, the GoLang seems pretty interesting. I need to get back on that. I started out trying to learning at the beginning of the pandemic and <laughs> kind of lost track. But one of the things I, I keep hearing people say, if you want to learn it, a good way to do it is just try to build something, try to do something, and not worry about trying to get through a book or a course. For, you know, a lot of the Black Hat for Go, Black Hat for Python, uh, uh, the hacker books, the first thing they want you to do is always build a network scanner. And that drives me up a freaking wall because then what it's going to try to do is you're going to think, maybe I can write a better uh, network scanner than Nmap. And <laughs> I, I don't want to, any of the little, the youngsters out there, the youth, the young people, the people getting into the industry, I don't want to discourage you. I can almost promise you, you're not going to write something better than Nmap. If you do, DM me, I'll be glad to use it. <laughs> but <laughs> like, like, but that's one of the things I hate. But you're right. So the thing that I always say is like, you know, oh, you want to learn a language? Go use Python and learn install other tools. Go use again, automate some of the things. If you're finding yourself doing something once a once a year, probably don't automate that. Once a pen test, maybe automate that. Twice a pen test, definitely automate that. Right, and you, it doesn't have to be complex you can call other programs to do the things for you and then put the results in a place you're just expecting it and that's simple i, I mean, okay, it's simple for me it might not be simple initially but you can do batch scripts with that shell scripts python you'd run powershell and linux to do that like come on it's 
all those things are available and it can't hurt to learn it. You don't have to. You want to yeah, save think, yourself time? Do it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of the areas that gets overlooked a lot. People ask if they need it, but there's sometimes I think that gets overlooked. I don't know that they need it. Yeah. It'll make I your think, life easier. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but don't you think with some of the advancements with, with stuff, I know like Burp Suite made some things easier to do, so it required people to, to not – learn how to script or, you know, you can do uh log in brute force with burp suite, which is easier than trying to play around with Hydra or something. Totally. Yeah. No. Um, so, and I mean, you know, again, ha- having a talk called, uh, you know, your home, uh, homegrown organic OSTs, offensive security tools. Yeah. I think you should build your own parsley, but again, you don't have to uh, burp uh, burp was a game changer. I really love the way that they've come together uh, and then a lot of their stuff was written in J- Jython and Python and this and that and the other. And you can put together so many things and, you know, making it that much easier to do things. I am never against that. But you're totally right. Like at this point, I don't want to boot up um, Hydra or any of the other tools anymore. If I can capture um, it through perp and figure out what the, you know, where the JW, if there's a token or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then go through that. I'm going to do that, especially if there's like captures in the way and the logins behind a captcha, you'll never beat that with Hydra, but then grab, you know, grabbing that post um, captcha page behind with burp and then just replaying that done. You already beat it. You don't need to worry about the captcha. You've, you've already, you know, mitigated their, their ability to stop password spraying. And that's why, you know, <clears throat> enable multi-factor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we're getting down towards the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to share? Any kind of wisdom before we conclude this episode? Oh, I'm full of useless wisdom. Uh, let me see if <laughs> got any good wisdom. Um, uh, besides, you know, when hiking, you know, double bunny knot your your boots, right? Yeah, you want you want to do that. Uh, don't fall down any trails. Uh, um, no, I think my best piece of uh, technical advice is again, follow your path. Um, you know, don't r- realize that no one was def- destined for InfoSec, right? Not Phil, not me, um, not, you know, the biggest names out there. There, there was never a point that any of us ever looked at ourselves and went, you know, I am going to be the greatest InfoSec. No, it just kind of was one of those things. We started doing things. People started showing up and, I feel like Phil's probably the same way. Even if people stop showing up one day for some, for whatever reason, I'm still going to keep going. And eventually people start showing up again, right? It's life happens uh, when you, when uh, find a mentor, find as many mentors as you can. That's, that's actually one. That, there you go. That's my best piece of advice. Find as many mentors as you can. If you're, if you're looking at Phil for advice and me, it's okay. Uh, we, uh, I will, I'm not, I don't feel threatened by Phil because I, first of all, think it's, if he had an opposing opinion on something and I have opposing opinion, draw your own conclusion from our opinions, because there's no reason that both of us could be wrong and your opinion could be better. Like, and you know, that's just the way the, the scale, the luxurious time of life is um, follow, you know, follow your dreams. Don't stop trying, uh, you know, won't, don't stop, won't stop kind of mentality. Uh, and, Learn the way you learn. That's another thing. Um, I don't let somebody else force you into a learning mechanism. If you find out that maybe the hands-on stuff like from OFSEC isn't for you, go back to the multiple choice stuff. Um, See if you can find equivalent certs. Find ways to study for those things. Find study teams, uh, partners, find groups. Um, So many people out there who want to teach and learn, and then they say, oh, but I'm not as good as you. It's okay. I'm not as good as you think I am either. <laughs> so go, uh, go learn, keep, uh, you know, my, I think my, my tagline, uh, for both dead pixel, uh, the community I run, you know, uh, Twitter, dead pixel sec, uh, we kind of stolen, uh, we're usually, uh, discord dot GG dead pixel sec, but uh, for right now I'm holding on to dead pixel or a discord dot GG slash info sec. Um, you know, Go learn from them. You don't have to learn from me. There's so many people in those communities. Uh, uh, Phil has t- what, Pwn School, po- this podcast, DC 904. Um, 
so many things that you can go learn from like find a community start learning uh educate and evolve is kind of the the ultimate tagline right like Always and and trust me, I if you don't think what you have to say has value, I, I promise you to someone it does. And to uh, Phil and myself and any of your mentors, it, even if you think they don't, if they know it, tell them anyway that you learned something interesting because you could help them find a way to teach better to do so many things. So uh, what you say has value and educate and evolve. There you go. That's my. Yeah my tagline yeah. there <laughs> great advice and just to encourage people to share like you said you're if you come across something share with your mentors or other people have been doing this for a while because one of the things when someone's starting their journey there's a lot of new stuff comes out and you're learning this stuff and people like joe and myself we've been in the industry for a while maybe we hadn't seen it yet so anytime Very we can true. share information we can help each other out so just because we've been doing it for a while don't mean we've seen there everything and so everyone does have something to contribute Absolutely. So thanks for, for joining. Thanks. I appreciate you sharing your story and uh, sharing your knowledge and wisdom there with our listeners. Thank you for having me again, Phil. Pleasure as always. Find me on uh, Twitter at The Blind Hacker, uh, Discord as The Blind Hacker, uh, you know, pound lead, 1337. Uh, I don't stream as much anymore, but I'm putting together videos. So uh, YouTube and again, best way to get a hold of me, Twitter, email, The Blind Hacker at DeadPixel sec.com that's it for me phil well thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you on the next episode bug crowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities protect customers and make the digitally connected world a safer place learn more at bugcrowd.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hacker Factory podcast with Philip Wiley. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itsbmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.